Hi everyone, welcome to the Panhandle Research and Technology Tour Plus, hosted by the Panhandle Research and Extension Center in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. This event was recorded on December 2nd, 2020. Uh, so uh, last but not least is um, Bob Harvison. He's a, a full professor of plant pathology and uh, he's gonna talk about uh, my second favorite topic, which is plant disease. And uh, we'll follow this up again with a bit of Q&A afterwards. And um, let's hear what Bob Harvison has to say about pathology in new pulse crops for 2020. This is a presentation that I am doing on some of the new pulse crops that have been grown the last several years. There's an increasing interest in these types of crops. And so just to try to be proactive, we are looking at some of the potential problems that may arise from these crops because we're not as familiar with them as we are some of our standard crops. This is a list of the various crops that we have been working on for the last five to six years. Dry yellow peas, chickpeas, cow peas, and then mung beans this last year. We have been looking at chickpeas since Carlos got here about 15 years ago, but, but we're still looking at different types of uh, diseases rather than just from Ascochyta. Now, this is a Ascochyta blight. Anybody who's ever grown chickpeas is familiar with this problem. It's worldwide the most severe and uh, most commonly occurring of any of the uh, types of uh, diseases. It's capable of um, infecting pods, stems, leaves, all above ground parts of the plant. So this is really a, a problem. We see it uh, severely in Nebraska as well. In terms of what can we do about Ascochyta blight, the eventually breeding for resistance is gonna be the one that's the most effective, but this takes time. You know, Carlos and I have been working on this for quite some time. There's been some that have been released, but still this is not, uh, this is a time consuming thing. There's also fungicidal options that uh, people can use, but this is limited because we have identified populations of the pathogen that have de developed resistance to a number of the different fungicides that we might use, particularly the strobal urines. This would include like headline and quadrus. So therefore, because of these types of issues, we, we wanted to go back and test the copper alternatives that have, have risen in the last decade. This is things that we have seen success with, with uh, bacterial diseases and dry beans. And so the concept was to test them for some other fungal diseases and then other pulse crops as well to see whether they work just as well as they did on dry beans. Now, as a result of these new types of crops that we're doing, cow peas is another one. And as a result of this, we've found that there are a number of similar but we don't know exactly the same pathogens involved with cow peas. Bacterial wilt, common wilt, common blight, root rots that appear to be Rhizoctonia and Fusarium, white mold, Phomopsis, stem canker. These are all diseases that we're somewhat familiar with, but we don't know if they're exactly the same ones that occur on our other uh, dry bean crops. There's also been some unidentified foliar disease that we've seen, and also a number of uh, viruses that we are still trying to, uh, to identify specifically. So the ca same concept that, that we had with the chickpeas, we're also trying on the cow peas to see if they work, these copper products work as well as they did on dry beans. Now in terms of uh, symptoms, this, uh, this is, would be characteristic of any kind of a root rot problem, and these are cow peas where you see the wilting and the yellowing of the leaves then the roots can look something like this. This is just a generalization of Rhizoctonia and the Fusarium root rots that we've been able to identify. This could be a little bit different than other things, but this is what they look like on, on cow peas. In terms of bacterial wilt, this uh, we have seen and, and have identified bacterial wilt, and it does appear to be exactly the same pathogen that gets in, in dry beans, and this would be characteristic of the symptoms the foliar symptoms with wilt. And then here's one, this, we don't see this uh, for everything, but this is one where you did get the wilting and it, it's actually killing the plant. But this isn't uh, normally the norm. Over the last three years, we've seen this particular problem in our cowpea plots in two of those three years. And it is, it is a unknown virus of some type. It's not a fertility issue or some unknown abiotic problem. It is 
uh, some sort of a, of a virus and we have been able to transmit this mechanically in several different years. Okay, this is a list of the different uh, chemicals that we have employed, you know, when we're talking about the copper alternatives, but we did want to compare those particular products with coside and proline. Coside is a copper product, proline is a standard fungicide that we use here. The sanidate and oxidate are both hydrogen peroxide oriented. The EcoAgra A300 is something that just, the, the uh, label just says something about being uh, plant-derived fatty acids, so I don't know exactly what that is. But the other four on this side are all biocontrol products that uh, were derived from bacillus, which is a bacterium. Now, this is uh, our cowpea project, our cowpea plots in 220 in the mid-August. And note the, uh, the flowers, they are flowering at this time. And there are the chickpeas over to the right, but we're, this is concentrating on cowpea plots. Within those plots this year, we found evidence of uh, potentially of some other virus problems. And so this is one in particular that seemed to be the most common that I found out there, but we have not been able to transmit this. So I don't know exactly whether it was a virus or not, but these symptoms that you see, the distortion of the leaves and the yellowing would be characteristic of certain viruses. And here's a second different type of symptom that uh, so shows the, uh, the green um, areas on there, but you do see sort of a mosaic pattern on those three leaves, and they are a little bit also elongated or distorted. Now this, this is another type that we saw in plots. This is highly suggestive of a virus, but you see the very elongated root, uh, leaves and then the raised bumps. But this also could uh, be confused with uh, herbicide damage and with some herbicides. So this is another thing that we need to, to establish. Here's our old friend, the, uh, the, the sunflower virus, and I'm certain is a virus because it has been transmitted and it just, it looks uh, like yellow paint has been spilled on it. So this is some, this, we have seen this multiple places within the field and in two of the last three years in our plots. So it is definitely a virus and that's what, the one that we're really interested in pursuing. In 220, we uh, just, just uh, for observational purposes, tried to plant some mung beans. We had trouble getting this one up, as you can see, and we did have some weed issues with this. But mung beans are very closely related to cow peas or black-eyed peas, and so they do look similar. They do have a little bit more pointed tip, but this is what they look like. And unfortunately, that uh, early frost that we got in the first part of September just was zapped these. So we were not able to get any kind of information from them. They didn't show any, any, any uh, symptoms of anything because of the uh, early frost. Now this is what the mung bean should look like later in the season. This is a, a, some, a picture of when I went to Australia last year. We went and saw these. Uh, uh, this was a, a research area that the uh, breeder was doing. So these are his breeding plots. And this is sort of what they look like. Now what we did find is that uh, like our dry beans and our cow peas, they have bacterial issues that look very similar in fact, their, their bacterial issues are probably a little bit worse than ours. I can see at least three different bacterial diseases on this particular picture with common blight, halo blight, and then wilt. And uh, they're particularly concerned about wilt. This is the one that seems to be the most severe of any of those other bacterial diseases. So that's something that we have to deal with if we start to produce this, this crop or if there's an interest in that. So that's something else we need to take, take into consideration. So in conclusion, over the last several years, um, we are unfortunately very inconclusive in terms of the data that we got. 218, for some reason, there was just no disease pressure at all. 219 was going to be a really good year. I mean, it was just hammered. You know, the Ascochyta blight was highly severe, and there was also problems in the cowpeas. But if you recall in 219 that the hailstorm, the series of hailstorms that came through, that took care of our plots, and so we did very poor yields after these storms that didn't, weren't associated with the, um, the diseases. So obviously there's much more work that needs to be done. We tried to repeat all these again in 220, but I don't think we're gonna get uh, very good results either because it was just so hot and dry this year. It, it, it just wasn't conducive for disease. So we need much more work and this is something that we will be pursuing. Um, we're gonna continue these studies, evaluating these, these different products 
on chickpeas, peas, cowpeas, all these other uh, types of uh, pulse crops. So we're also going to be using these because they're, they're currently available for growers. And we're interested not only in, in having these studies at the, the center, but also uh, in grower fields as, as another uh, alternative site if there is some interest in that and we can find some collaborators. Another thing I didn't talk about, but this is something that we all are also doing, is that these pathogens that we are finding in these, these alternate pulse crops, we are saving those and taking them and then we're inoculating dry beans in the greenhouse as a concept. If we can show that they are pathogens of dry beans too, because this is something that needs to be considered if we're going to expand and start increasing these, uh, these, these different types of crops to know that they are as susceptible or less susceptible or whatever to the, uh, to the diseases as uh, our dry beans are. And then that particular virus, uh, number four in cowpeas, I'm going to continue working with that, trying to keep it in the greenhouse alive in different plants because we have to continually inoculate to keep it going and then try to find a collaborator who's interested in, in working with us on doing that. And then lastly, I'm, I'm interested in the mung bean thing again. So we will be planting them to a certain extent, just a little bit, and just observing things, just trying to see how they work and, and whether they might also be another alternative uh, option for growers here. With that, so if there's any questions, I think I've gotten through that. Thanks, Bob. Well, we've got some time here for a bit of Q&A. If anybody's still awake. Oh, I, one of these 13 at least are awake. I think um, we've got a question here from, from Tyler Kennedy regarding the sunflower virus. He says, for the sunflower virus you mentioned, is there a way to determine if it is, or if it is over or under water? I think he's asking if there's a way to determine if it's a, a water or nutrient shortage in the soil um, or if, um, or if it's, uh, or if the, just the virus has been described or. Okay. Well, that, that's one of the main things that, um, th the reason why I, when I see something I suspect is virus, that's why you try to, uh, to transmit it to another plant. If you can transmit it to another plant and create those same types of symptoms, then it's not a, uh, you know, a fertility issue or some other problem. I mean, you don't know exactly what it is uh, potentially, but still that is a, a, um, the first thing I would do when you find something like that, that you don't know what it is. See if you can produce new disease on the, the crop itself again. See, it's right. part so of the postulates. Right, so you're in the process now of taking what you think might've been a viral infection and taking the, the basically the serum that you get out of the plant inoculating it to new plants to see if it yeah, is that, transmissible. Right. Because and, and we have confirmed that with that number four onto to, uh, cowpeas. It, it's right. definitely some transmissible agent. It's not any kind of fertility or, or, or issue or abiotic. Right. Um, the thing we don't know is what type, what, what the next step that we're doing now is we're taking that and we're from the cowpeas and grinding it up and, uh, and inoculate, we're inoculating dry beans to see if it also is, is a host of this particular issue. A lot of those legume viruses will, will be transmissible to other um, species, but some of them are not. That, that'll be right. part of our, our diagnostic uh, process. Because obviously you can't inoculate uh, a nutrient deficiency or, or water Correct. deficiency. Correct. Yeah, that's one way to uh, um, you know, pull that one out is not being an issue. I've got a question with your sunflower virus, Bob. Is that the same sunflower virus that you've been working with in the perennial flowers? Yeah, and, and honestly, that's that was a, a mistake. That was, uh, thanks for noticing that, guys. Um, when I said sunflower virus, I didn't mean the one that I've been working with. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I meant that was the number four virus and and I for some reason I said sunflower virus and I, I caught that myself yesterday, but uh, so and so you were paying attention anyway. But yeah, no, that's right. I was paying the, attention. The, the sun, the, the the virus I I have discovered on sunflowers, I'm fairly certain will not go to uh, the pulse crops. Okay, well that's what got me excited. I thought, wow, a virus and sunflower transmits to well, know, uh, a cowpea yeah. that would be remarkable. It, it would be. 
but but this the, the what 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 I was trying to illustrate was that that thing that we found on cowpea in multiple years in multiple fields is transmissible to cowpeas itself. And so that that would prove that it is not some fertility or some abiotic issue. It is a transmissible disease agent of some kind, which I'm right. assuming is a virus. So viruses, uh, are, real, viruses are not real easily. Um, you can't grow them. So, you, you know, to keep them alive, you have to continually be inoculating new plants or you have to have some method of, of freezing or some other type of uh, uh, source of, uh, of storage. Fastidious, they might say. That's right. Yeah. So Emily asked a question, our very own Emily Stein. Uh, how do you tell the difference between different bacterial pathogens if the symptoms all look so similar? What uh, does it come down to lab diagnostics? Well, that's that's another thing to consider. Different there's there's probably four or five specific bar, the, the bacterial pathogens that we would see in Nebraska, and so on on dry beans, and we've learned to distinguish those just by morphology and by several different the lab tests that we can do real quickly. But in general, that's part of what I'm trying to do is it are these some of these uh, Pseudomonas species and I'm finding on, on dry peas are those the same suit there, there's two Pseudomonas pathogens of dry beans, but I don't know if they're exactly the same. And so that would require some molecular work and some additional um, inoculation work, but that's that's something we don't really know. We do know fairly well how to distinguish those four major virus, uh, uh, um, four major uh, pathogens, bacterial pathogens of dry beans. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty good on that. But but some of these others that we're finding on other crops, we don't know if they're exactly the same, and that's that's one of the goals of this project. One of the questions I had, Bob, was. Um, you mentioned uh, you had a slide where you talked about copper alternative products that you're evaluating. Um, and I'm curious, do all of these alternative products, I know that you've got strobil urines, uh, peroxide based ones and, and uh, uh, bacillus based ones, do they, do they all control the pathogen in the same way? Um, I'm not really sure, Jeff, that there's a lot of those that are bacillus oriented and I don't know exactly the the mechanism of how they work. The, uh, the hydrogen peroxide ones are just w w what you would find with uh, with a disinfectant. Mm -hmm. You know, they're contact type of thing. And I disrupt just, cell oh, walls and that sort of thing. Yeah, these are most. These are all pretty much just contact because they're not systemic in the plants when you apply them, mm. and so they're only probably going to be effective if the pathogen is present on that leaf when you hit it, because they're also mm. not going to be long lived. They could be washed mm -hmm. off or uh, or uh, just they, they would, I guess they would lose some degree of, uh, of virulence, but you know, copper itself is, is uh, toxic, you know, to a mm -hmm. lot of living things. And so that's, that's where it's all come stemming from really. They're, it, I would Paris, say they're more, all, they're all protectants more than anything. Paris green, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Pliny, Pliny the elder, I think discovered Paris green and it was a little uh, bit, was that? It was a little bit after that. Yeah. A little bit after Pliny the Elder. Yeah, yeah. but that, that's the old, uh, uh, what's it, uh, the... Um, AD, right? Yeah. 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 After. Back, in the, back in the day. Yeah. It was um, in the 1700s, 1800s anyway, early 1800s. Right, right. Uh, John Thomas is asking a question, what diseases does Sanidate have some value in treating? Well, I think um, the only things that I have actually seen myself is those bacterial pathogens in dry beans. I've had other consultants and other people say that they've seen um, good control measures with white mold and with, with several different crops and also with uh, different uh, wheat rusts, wheat stripe, stripe rust. And I've, I've had people tell me that. And we have tried to do those sorts of things, but it seems like every time we try something like that, we don't get enough disease pressure to evaluate it. Mm -hmm. You know, the wheat stripe rust was a big problem, I don't know, five, six years ago. We got some money, we, we tried to do some projects with it, but um, it just didn't show up. 
-hmm. So I guess I really don't know for, for sure, John, but I would uh, imagine that it's um, it, it just any of, I think it would work well on any uh, a bacterial or fungal pathogen that it, it contacted, but it wouldn't be probably very effective for something that's a wilt pathogen that's inside the, uh, inside the plant and is, can't, can't get to it. Have you tried sanitate on beets for any beet diseases, Bob? Um, I, I tried it one year for sarcospora mm -hmm. and again, didn't get a lot of pressure. So I can't say, I, I would, I would assume it would be, it would be uh, as effective as anything else mm -hmm. just because it's a contact, you know, contact uh, cis, cis, uh, uh, mechanism. Right. Let's see. Another question I've got. Um, yeah, so I'm just curious about uh, some of these pulse crop diseases that you talked about, um, cowpea, uh, et cetera. Um, if the, some of these diseases, the bacterial fungal diseases um, share, if those diseases would, these diseases could cross over into dry beans and some of the more commercially uh, produced crops currently. That's, that's to me the big question. That's one of those two projects that we're really doing is that we are finding diseases of these particular crops and we're trying to characterize them and then test to see whether they are pathogenic on dry beans because that is something mm -hmm. Carlos needs to know or you know, we, we also need to know, you know if we're talking about rotation type things, that's something that rotation with those crops may not solve your problem if you have disease issues. Mm -hmm. Or so you're, you're, you're conducting those evaluations in the greenhouse now, that's, right? That's right. Just to see if they are um, the same thing or, or maybe even some, some, some of these pathogens like fusarium tends to be a little more, it, it's, it's, it's more specific on what it hits. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not over, you know, like Rhizoctonia seems to have a much larger range um, on, on different crops, but the fusariums tend to be more specific. The, like the fusarium that we see in, uh, in dry beans is not the same fusarium that causes a wilt in, um, in, in dry beans and vice versa. Right. Yeah, actually it leads into another question I had if some of these, um, some of these pathogens that you've identified cause disease in different ways on different plants, but it's the same pathogen. Um, is that what you're seeing with some of these that you're working with now, possibly? Um, you know, it's a, it's a root disease on one plant, but it's a foliar disease on another, those sorts I of things. I don't think so. That, I mean, they're, they're, Rhizoctonia has been known to cause a web blight, you know, a, a, a foliar web blight, but that's, that's very, very rare. So no, I don't think you would find a lot of um, root pathogens that would cause a foliar disease on another crop. I don't mm -hmm. think, I don't think that's going to be very common, but that's part of the, you know, that's, uh, that would be something that hopefully we would, uh, we would learn from this particular project that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you'd mentioned earlier um, that you're looking for some field collaborators. Um, yeah. And I see you've got your email address up there. I don't know if there's any other way that people can reach you. That you'd want to share to collaborate just, with you. No, on yeah, this. that's uh, you know, there's there's just different people that that I know that I've talked to myself, and and they're willing to do this. But you know, two twenty was was not very good because we because of our travel um, limitations and that sort of thing. So we didn't we didn't do any off station work like we had planned on doing. But I still would like to do that. Different collaborators, if 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 they're if they're interested in we would be just using a small part of a field, you know, with uh, probably a five or six treatment uh, for rep type of thing. So we wouldn't be taking a whole lot of room up, but we would like to try it on, on a, in different locations because when mm -hmm. something happens uh, environmentally, if you have different sites that are somewhat spread apart, then you're more likely to get use, useful information. Yeah, I know. You get, so a, get a plant pathologist. Yeah. Instead of losing a home, you know, like we did uh, last year because of that hail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to get a plant pathologist started on disease triangle. We'll be here forever. That's right. <laughs> Let's see. Um, 
I don't see any other questions. I think um, I think we've had a fairly quiet audience today, but do appreciate those who have chimed in with some questions. I think um, I think we're coming up on time, Bob. Uh, okay. Anything else you want to share with the group? Uh, no, just thanks for thanks for joining us, and uh, and we'd like to. We, we I know we would really like to get some feedback on on what what. Is this something that we want to continue? I mean, this this is um, it's a, it's a novel way of of uh, doing re doing extension, but isn't that what we're supposed to try and be doing anyway? We are we are doing novel today. Thank you all, and have a great evening.